Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. A joy to be with all of you this evening. You need to pray for me while I'm speaking because I chose a very challenging topic and I realized that in 39 years of priesthood I never gave a talk on this. Maybe that's why it was time. All of us have the experience of uh, evil in the world and the from Holy Scripture and from the Fathers of the Church, we have in the Orthodox Church a specific understanding of evil. I wanted to speak about that this evening. Then I wanted to pose a number of questions, eight of them actually. I'm hoping I'm not taking all of your questions away from you when I'm doing that, but whenever I prepare a topic, I think about what it would be like to listen to it and then what questions I might pose if I were hearing a topic addressed. I'd like to read just a few lines for you from a very well-known 20th century Orthodox theologian. I'll tell you who he is in a minute. Just listen to what he has to say about evil. It has long been accepted that evil has no substance, or, as St. John of Damascus puts it, it is insubstantial. As something that lacks true being, evil has a negative and privational character. Yet, as St. Gregory of Nyssa says, in the very non-being, it has being. The root and substance of evil consistent deception and error. Evil is active in the world and through its actions it becomes real. Evil introduces new qualities into the world as if adding something to the God-given reality, something that was neither willed nor made by Him, although it happens with God's permission, evil, a novelty that in one sense does not exist, enigmatically becomes real and strong. Father George Florovsky, 1928, his famous essay, Creation and Creativeness. As an aside, I can't recommend Father George Florovsky to you more. I, someone that I think if, when you turn to difficult subjects, like the one we are considering this evening, Father George Florovsky is a well, a source of wisdom. In this short passage, Father Florovsky cites three fathers of the Church. The first one was Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. It has long been accepted that evil has no substance. That's Saint Irenaeus. And then, of course, he cites Saint John of Damascus, who came later and who is very systematic in his presentation of every subject, probably the most systematic of all of the Fathers in terms of how he wrote. And St. John says it is evil, insubstantial. And then it's St. Gregory who says in the very non-being it has being, St. Gregory of Nyssa. And so you see we have a very early Father, St. Irenaeus is quite early, and then a Father of the 5th century, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and then St. John of Damascus, who comes later, 4th century for St. Gregory. What do they mean? I read this passage and it was impressive. And then I asked the obvious question, 
What do they mean? Evil has no existence, no substance. Evil was not created by God, Father George Flodowski is writing, yet he allows it to exist. They mean that because God did not create evil, it doesn't have its own proper form of existence. It can only exist as a lie, as the absence of good, or as open rebellion against it. You might think a little bit about darkness. Really, when we consider darkness, for us, it is the absence of light. It's light that has the substance. When you remove light, you have darkness. But you have darkness only because light is not there. Here in this case, you have the good. And we're going to talk about a little bit more about what the good is. The good has an existence, has a substance. It's quite substantial. But evil does not. It is only that which opposes itself to good. Evil comes into being not because God wills it, but because he allows it. More specifically, evil can only come into being when someone conceives it and brings it into action. That person or that being becomes the creator, if you like, of that evil. An evil which never needed to exist and never should have. This may all seem just a little bit too philosophical. In truth it is not. It is true theology and therefore it is the stuff of life. That is what theology is. But perhaps an example from Holy Scripture would help us better understand the mechanics of evil. My choice, if we are to have a choice regarding evil in the Scripture, is King Herod. I did not choose an atheist. I chose a Jew who knew the Scripture. I chose, in addition, someone I might term a failed disciple of St. John the Baptist, or perhaps someone who never became his disciple, even though he very much respected him. We read in St. Mark's Gospel that Herod knew St. John to be a holy man and a great prophet. He loved to listen to him, although, as we read, he was also perplexed when he heard him. You probably know the gospel that I'm referring to. It's from a feast, a very solemn feast in the Orthodox Church. It's the Feast of the Beheading. You and your parish, or parishes rather, celebrated at the end of August, I would think. You may find it rather intriguing that in Slavic Orthodox parishes where we keep the so-called old calendar, the date you may find intriguing, September 11th. The Feast of the Beheading of St. John the Baptist. Let me just refresh your memory a little. It seems that Herod had no intention of killing St. John. He did so, we read, because of his oath. What oath, you might ask? The oath he took when Herodias' daughter danced for Herod and for all of his courtiers, for his entourage, and as the Gospel puts it very delicately, they were very pleased. Herodias conceives the evil. Her daughter sets the stage for it. Herod brings it into existence. On one hand, if one wanted to try to be sympathetic to Herod, and it's rather hard to do so, 
One might argue that he is a victim of deceit himself, therefore evil. But in the Gospel, he certainly appears as evil's perpetrator. He also appears as irrational, foolish. He tells the daughter of Herodias, I'll give you anything that you ask for, up to half of my kingdom. Just ask me for it. And then, of course, when she went to her mother, to Herodias, and asked, what should I ask for? The mother didn't ask for half of the kingdom. She asked for something infinitely greater than half of the kingdom. She asked for the head of the greatest prophet of all time on a platter. On the spiritual level, the situation is clear. Herod, a Jew, who read the scripture, who heard the prophets, gives the order to kill the greatest of all the prophets. It is a total disaster. It appears that evil has won. The church, however, knows better, or knows more. St. John the Baptist, we are told in the hymns of the church, on the feast, descends into Hades, and there proclaims the coming of the Messiah to the dead. He appears in glory at Christ's left in Orthodox iconography, the right side being reserved for the Holy Theotokos. Evil, therefore, is defeated through death. That which, on one hand, is our enemy, death, is used by God to stop evil from having any kind of eternal existence. Evil returns to non-being, the state in which it properly belongs. And God sets right what human beings have destroyed. It's quite the story. And through it, we understand a little bit more about how evil works, the mechanics of evil, how it's generated, its genesis, how it comes into being. But there are a number of questions connected with the genesis of evil that vex people very much, and appropriately so. I was very struck that many people think about this. And in a somewhat unlikely situation, although my brother priests listening to me this evening will say, it's not very unlikely, I've seen it before, I was approached myself by someone on Somerset Street. I was alone at church during the week. I opened the door, front door of the church, and as I stepped out onto the front porch, there was a gentleman passing by. He smiled at me and stopped. He said, are you the priest of this church? I said, yes, I am. He said, I have a question for you. I thought, well, we're starting quickly. And let me tell you, the question was, at what, it was not, at what time is your service on Sunday? Here was his question. I'd never seen this man before. Tell me why God didn't destroy evil right at the beginning. And there I am, on the front porch of my own church, answering one of the most significant questions a human being could ever ask for one man on Somerset Street West. So, I'll give you the answer I gave him. At the beginning, evil did not exist, so it did not need to be destroyed. 
Evil comes into being through a choice, an act of the will. Now I'll add something into here I did not use with him, since I assumed he was not of Orthodox background. An act of the will that is not according to nature is not, as the Father's writing, Greek, kakathisi, not according to nature, in rebellion against nature, in other words. If, therefore, evil emerges through a perverse act of the weak and sick will, God would need to remove from the will any possibility to choose, and this he is not prepared to do. He thought, I thought, I looked, and both of us together experienced a little something of the mystery of the question. So let me ask a few more. The questions he didn't ask because perhaps he was too polite, or realized the questions would become steadily more difficult and did not want to subject me to them. Question number two. Why not compromise the will if removing choice can save lives? It's an important question. God created in freedom and creates that which is free. Freedom is not a condition that we came upon or achieved ourselves. Freedom was given to us by God. Furthermore, freedom is part of the image, the image of God that every human being has received. God could not move against freedom because he would essentially be moving against his own nature, something that is not possible for him. Question number three. Are we going to have to wait until the end of time? in order for evil to be defeated? In the conclusive sense, yes. But evil's back has already been broken by God. It no longer can continually, it can no longer continue indefinitely. Its time is marked. Question number four. Are we passive victims in the meantime? Or is there anything we can do to contribute to the eradication of evil? Yes, we can seek to refrain from conceiving evil in our own selves. If we are unable to refrain from conceiving it, we can at least stop it from coming into action. We can deny evil its existence because it does not have one. It's a huge thing to say. We can deny evil its existence because it does not have one. Is there anything we can do, question number five, on the corporate level? Or are we restricted to fighting evil in our personal lives? Yes, there is. We are called as Christians to address evil corporately, expose it, condemn it, and do everything within our power to stop it. If we are unable to stop it, we can at least address its consequences. Question number six. Why is refraining from evil so difficult for us? Refraining from evil is not a decision simply to resist it. Repentance is the necessary beginning of the struggle against evil. Without repentance, evil will continue to exist. Repentance, however, involves not only turning from evil and sin, it includes turning to Christ. Furthermore, there is a cost to us, we must continue turning from evil and sin every day of our lives. Question number seven. I hope you're still with me. Adam and Eve 
We're not created with an inclination towards evil. Why did God allow the serpent to tempt them? Why not reduce the risk of failure by placing them in an environment where the devil could not tempt them? Evil predates the creation of the world and of humanity. Evil finds its cosmic origin in the irrational decision of angelic beings to rebel against God. When Adam and Eve were created, evil already existed. If evil was in the cosmos, it was in the world, since our world reflects something and somehow all that is. If evil was already present in the world, God could not protect humanity from evil without removing from humanity the power of self-governance. Self-governance is an expression that the fathers of the church use, a God-given quality that includes the power to choose. Humanity was called instead to mature to the point of being able to resist evil freely. Humanity failed, but God still redeems humanity in Christ and sets it on the course of salvation. How did God address evil in Genesis and in the history of salvation? Evil entered the world through Adam. Fathers of the Church use Adam in two ways. Adam can refer to the person Adam, and Adam can refer to all of humanity. Humanity can be called properly Adam. Evil entered the world through Adam. Evil was defeated in the new Adam, Christ. Adam and Eve were given the garments of skin that we read about in the book of Genesis. The fathers of the church understand them to be not simply primitive clothing, but actually a means by which humanity could survive in a world which is now overcome by death and which evil has become a reality, acquiring a shadowy existence. They and we were waiting for the second Adam, Christ, who did what the first Adam did not do. He became obedient in all things and defeated evil as a man. I want to stop there for the moment. It may strike you as obvious that the Lord defeated evil as a man, since we know him to be fully divine and fully human, one person in two natures. But think a little bit about the hymns of the Church, crucified in the flesh, baptized also in the flesh. There's a reason why the Fathers of the Church are saying these things, and why they are so important that we sing them as doctrine. The Fathers of the Church are stressing the fact that Christ does these things not only as God, but as perfect man, as the perfectly obedient Adam, as the Adam who obeyed God in all things, who was tempted and who resisted. And the fact that Christ does this as a man is very important, critically important for us. It means that humanity has finally defeated evil, or more precisely, theologically speaking, that Christ has defeated evil as a man and has now made that victory over evil directly available to us. So that this situation of Christ defeating evil as a man becomes the key. Here we find the reversal of what happened in Genesis. 
where Adam and Eve succumbed to evil, Christ does not. And so, instead, he defeats it. He defeats it as a man, making it possible for men and women in Christ to defeat evil as well. It is a critical turning point. We are unable to say that evil has been defeated conclusively. But we are able to say that evil is defeated decisively. And this is what I mean by the back of evil being broken. Now, of course, you and I have no excuse to create evil where it didn't exist. Because if we are baptized, we have been clothed with Christ, we have put him on as a garment, and now we also, in Christ, are able to defeat evil, or if you prefer, Christ in us can defeat evil.